so I want to talk about um, the project that we're involved in and I want to explain more about it than it. Do I want to turn it off? I want to mute it. That's it. Um, so I want to talk about it in general terms and then if I get to any technical details at the end then I do and if I don't then I don't. Um, so it's a, it's a long term project and we're sort of starting <coughs> rather than finishing. Um, so, you know, we've, we've got lots of aspirations, but we haven't done it all yet. So, so this isn't about, the th you know, the, all the results. So, so let's start with the ideas. So, um, so space-time from non commutative geometry. Uh, and the idea is, is to test out the hypothesis that, that space-time has some sort of non-commutative structure. Uh, and why, why are we doing this? Well, so the idea is that quantum gravity, quantum gravity has a Planck scale. So the Planck length is the square root of gh bar. Which is some very tiny length scale, 10 to the minus 35 meters or something, is that right? Um, and what we do is we assume this is a minimum length scale. In other words, there's no physics that goes on at, in smaller length scales. Um, well, it's certainly true that there has to be some new structures at that length scale. I mean, it's possible that physics does go on beyond that length scale. But I, but I point out that we don't know any physics beyond that length scale. There are no phenomena for the length scale smaller than the, the Planck length. So I'm going to assume that's a minimum length and therefore a maximum energy. So that's the sort of built-in assumption. And the point is you don't see this in, in, uh, in more conventional physics. You don't see in, so you don't see it in quantum field theory, because then you send g to zero to get quantum field theory, and then this point out goes to zero. And you don't see it in general relativity either, because the h bars goes to zero. And similarly, this Planck scale structure disappears. So the idea is that, is that these two limits, quantum field theory and general relativity, are singular limits where you, you, you send this Planck scale to zero in different ways, and then you somehow have um, uh, a structure in which all the non-commutativity has disappeared, and you recover uh, back the usual continuum physics on the manifold uh, in which the, the, you know, the lengths can go all the way down to zero. That's the idea. Yeah, so a commutative manifold. So when I say manifold, I mean commutative. So an ordinary manifold that you're used to uh, does not have a Planck scale. A Planck cutoff. So, in other words, there are modes on a manifold of uh, infinitely high energy, or energy as high as you like. Um, <coughs> and of course, you yeah, know, that fact makes uh, manifold based approaches to quantum gravity very difficult because you're starting with. Uh, with a theory that in principle has modes of inf infinitely high energy and then you're trying to build in some structures, some new fields or something really clever to make some structure at the Planck scale which possibly implements a cutoff and that's a very difficult thing to do. So, you know, the idea of this new approach is, is not to start from the manifold and try and build structures on it but try and build something new and different which has this as some kind of limit. Okay, um, there's a familiar example 
of non-commutative structures, which sort of illustrates what I'm talking about, and that's just in quantum mechanics. Um, and quantum mechanics you can think of as phase space, so the quantum mechanics of a particle, a phase space, which is uh, R6, um, so three position and three momentum coordinates, and you have one state per, per h cubed, h bar cubed volume in this phase space. So this, uh, and of course, this phase space is non-commutative because X and P don't commute. That's something to do with H bar and so on, and then you know, I H bar, whatever, uh, and then that comes in there. So you can understand the non-commutativity of quantum mechanics in terms of this sort of cut-off, idea of cut-off in the phase space. You can't have, uh, you can't divide phase space into infinitely small small pieces. Okay, so this is non-commutative here. These. So, so, it's not, uh, so it's not an outrageous idea. It's an idea we're actually all used to, but in this different context of, of, uh, of phase space. So, so there are lots of versions of, uh, of non-commutative geometry. Um, I mean, if you look in the literature, you'll see people talk about non-commutative geometry, and, and they're in different places, and they all mean different things. Um, although, roughly, usually they have some something in common, which is you have some sort of coordinates that don't commute, and that's the sort of minimum requirement you need to talk about non-commutative geometry. But then, what you do after that is kind of up to you, and there's various different ways in which uh, you can you can do that. Uh, and not all actually have a Planck scale. Not all have what I'll call a Planck scale. And you can take, you know, the algebra of coordinates on space-time and make it non-commutative in some way by deforming it, but still have modes that are infinitely high energy. That's perfectly possible. And there's whole theories in that direction. Um, so, so I'm not talking about those. Um, but the ones that do, um, so non-commutative geometry uh, with a Planck scale, uh, this is inverted commas because of course it's not, you know, it, it's, I just mean some sort of cutoff scale. Um, for example, uh, geometric quantization. Which is sort of like the quantum mechanics I was talking about earlier, but in other geometric shapes, usually for a compact manifold with more structure on it. Uh, fuzzy spaces, which I'll talk about later quite a lot. And this is these are where you whoa, you <laughs> your coordinates on your manifold become matrices. So it's quite a popular idea. So any sort of theory in which you have matrices of coordinates is called a fuzzy space. So this is a very general idea and there's fuzzy things investigated with lots of structures or very little structure sometimes. Uh, Joe? Yeah? I have a question. Since you have talked about motivations, yeah. uh, would you be able to explain how you were led to this uh, area of computer geometry? Uh, how does it connect? For you, was what you were doing before. Easy. I could, yes. Were you safe if you were doing all this? Uh, um, I mean, spin foams. Yeah, it does connect a bit with spin foams, but I, mm, I might come to that. Ask me again a bit later. Okay, so another thing, well, actually, so here we go, here's, here's a connection quantum groups at roots of unity. <laughs> at uh, root of unity. So these, in some sense you have some non-commutative discretization of, of spaces 
uh, relative to quantum groups. And that very much turns up in spin foams. So, so in spin foams, you, um, well, so your first, it's spin foams is very much to do with representation theory in which you can recast in geometric quantization. So that's already the first sort of non commutativity. And you can also do a Q deformation and then make and talk about quantum groups at root, root of unity. And that, that again is um, some sort of discrete geometry, but it's non commutative. And so it's. You say that the connection is just that the same mathematics is used. Yeah. Is there more? Yeah, so for example, you can think of. of um, well, I'll, I'll say this probably again in a minute. You can think of geometric quantization to do with curved joint orbits. Um, and uh, <coughs> so there's a particular um, manifold in, a, in, a, in, the, in the dual of the Lie algebra. And down here, these spaces get deformed into curved uh, varieties. So, so uh, yeah. But these structures come up in, in various quantum gravity things. Um, so I'm particularly interested in, so I'm interested in, in Alan Kahn's so I'm using Alan Kahn's spectral triples. triples. Um, for various reasons. Um, and so this is a particular brand of non commutative geometry. So non commutative geometry big, con uh, spectral triple, uh, a smaller part. Um, and it's based on the Dirac operator. So we have Dirac operator. Uh, plus plausible axioms. And this is your notion of geometry. You say equals. So we're used to uh, the the Dirac operator in geometry, in normal geometry. So in the commutative case, C for commutative. You write some formula like the Dirac operator is you have some gamma matrices, some frame fields, depend on position, some covariate derivative, act on spinners. <coughs> and then from that you can abstract these frame field coefficients and make the metric tensor. So In fact, you get the inverse metric this way as a function of x. So from the data in the Dirac operator, you can extract the metric and vice versa with the metric and a tiny bit extra in the spin structure, you can get a Dirac operator. So in non-commutative geometry, um, you, you simply do the same thing, but you generalize the axioms. And there's quite a long history now of generalizing these axioms. So starting with, so, you, so write down this Dirac operator, uh, work out a mathematical framework for it, write that in the form of axioms, and now allow the algebra of functions to be non-commutative. Um, so this is mostly done by Alan Kahn, but other people helped. Um, and we've more or less arrived at what we, a list of axioms, but it's slightly flexible. Uh, flexible slightly. So, so to give you a little potted history, slightly. So it started with, with Alan Kahn's axioms in about 1995. Well, actually, early attempts started in so, so late 80s probably. But, but really, 
yeah, the, the, the modern thing that we now recognize was more or less in place in 1995. And then it was updated in 2006 when there was a, there was a slight correction. One of the actions wasn't quite right in, in there. Um, and then since then, um, people have tried various other modifications and there's no total compelling uh, advance on the 2006 version, so that's what I'm talking about. Um, and the issue is you can tweak some of the actions, you can perhaps add some new ones to make it more rigid or you can drop some to make it a bit more flexible. You can't do a lot, you can't just throw them all away and you, you know, it's not a free-for-all. You have to have a really good reason. And um, Most of this is motivated in fact by particle physics. So in fact, um, um, uh, so these actions here were developed to describe the standard model in, in particle physics. Um, I'll say a bit about that in a minute. Uh, yeah. <coughs> and then people wanted to get the Higgs mass right, and then it came out slightly wrong, and then people changed the actions slightly and said, oh yeah, it's, maybe it's right again. Yeah, so, okay, that's right. Yeah, so you generalise the axioms. Yeah, okay, yeah, so what do we do? Oh, no, we might do. Yeah, that's what we've done. Okay, so, so uh, let's describe this a bit. So the algebra functions. Functions on a manifold, functions on a manifold, which is of course commutative, uh, this generalizes, so this is the commutative case here, this is a non-commutative generalization, just becomes some algebra, some non-commutative algebra. Okay. And the fermion fields you normally have so what do they become? they become a bimodule over the algebra And to explain what that means is, if you all uh, oh right, and, and it also it also forms a Hilbert space, which is a Hilbert space. Um, and um, so, if you have a wave function, a fermion field in this Hilbert space, then you can take elements of the algebra of the functions, so A and B in here, and then you can multiply this on the left and on the right. So that's also in the Hilbert space. And these two actions on the left and the right, they commute to each other. That's what bimodule means. And this structure is somewhat surprising, but it's seen in the standard model already, in fact, this structure. Yeah, so let's say this here. See the standard model. In fact, so I don't want to talk about this, but, but there is an algebra. So you can think of this standard model as uh, space time the product of space time and the in internal space. I like Kaluza Klein, if you like. And the surprising thing is that the, the best way to think of this internal space is it's non commutative. And that, that, you know, that turns out to be a very good idea. And when you do this, you find the fermion fields form a bimodule. In fact, when looked at in the right way, is every fermion field has two charges. Which 
two in exactly two charges. It's a little obscured in the usual presentation of the standard model because you normally the fermion fields have one, two, or three charges. Um, but uh, if you rewrite it in the right way, so sort of change the variables in the right way, then it falls out everything is exactly two. And that's precisely because there's two commuting actions of some algebra. So that seems to be a really good structure we know already from from uh, okay. but I'm not terribly interested in the particle physics that's why I don't talk about this too much um, so the third element is of this spectral triple after all it's a triple is a Dirac operator And that's the same thing in, in commutative and non-commutative, it's just some operator on this space of fermion fields. So then your operator on, on, the, on the fermion fields. So that's your non commutative. Yeah. Well, what's quite interesting to learn more about this binomial structure. Can you give a reference? Well, uh, yeah, so, um, so, so there's a great article by Kong uh, in 1995 in JMP, Journal of Mathematical Physics, uh, and the title is Reality something, Real or Reality, I've forgotten now, but that's really explained in there in a nice way. In, in the particle physics context, it's at the end of the article, so don't read all the gaff at the beginning. Okay, uh, where am I up to? Yes. So a lot of this technology grew up in particle physics, but I'm interested in applying it to quantum gravity. So this bit we sort of understand here, and I'm assuming that all the particle physics people sort of now, you know, this is understood. And what I'm interested in doing is applying it to this piece here, which is, that's the sort of new project. In particle physics, you don't do anything with space-time, you just think of this as an ordinary manifold R for Minkowski space, if you like, where you can have curved space time if you're Chris Fuster, not in the way. Um, but now I want to make this non commutative to build in the Planck scale. That's the project. And that's a new project. So, one of the benefits of doing this, uh, the screen will come down, yeah, so that's all right. Uh, so, benefits of non commutativity. Uh, so one, it, it, you get a, a Planck scale structure, structure. Roughly speaking, it's the scale in which the non-commutativity becomes important. And, but the second one, which is really important for us, is that finite dimensional versions make sense. In a, in a new way. And, and doing this and investigating this, this leads, or we hope will lead, to computable quantum gravity. So just, just to, uh, as an aside really, about quantum gravity, uh, so for most of the time of its life since it started in perhaps the 1940s or something, uh, people have thought of approaching quantum gravity by you start with some grand scheme and you write down some uh, great theory which you hope kind of works and you quantize gravity by writing down loads of operators or something or you uh, have some new particle content or some stringy stuff or something or you quantize <coughs> gravity in a different way with loops or something. Um, and eventually, if you work hard enough at that, that just solves all the problems and eventually you can compute everything. Well, that's never ever worked, at doing such a thing. So there's now more a, uh, a move to say, well, we don't understand all those really complicated big schemes. We're going to do something computable. And uh, there are quite a few projects now where people start with 
with models which are perhaps not the whole story and it's acknowledged you know that there isn't a complete scheme of everything and everything doesn't fit together and this may not be physics completely but at least it's computable and hell we're going to go away and compute it and the computer will produce lots of stuff and we'll then be able to see you know phase transitions and scaling and normalization flows and everything which the other people can only dream of because they're nowhere near that sort of theoretical development so anyway so we're hoping to you know that, our, that at least what we're doing fits into this scheme of computable on the road so what do I mean by finite dimensional version? I mean that uh, just a minute, just a minute. I mean that this, I mean that this Hilbert space is finite dimensional. So, um, so this means that H is finite dimensional. And then the algebra A is an algebra of matrices. So you can see here that. Now, everything really is computable. Yes, question. Since you mentioned that all other approaches are nowhere near computable, what about string theory? Yeah. So why is it why is it not computable well, in what sense? If it was, we would people would be telling us what the results were. But it's definitely computable. Right? There, are com there are computations one can do. Right? Oh, so. Yeah. So please go ahead. Yes. Sure. A bit louder. <laughs> I guess the challenge is though to you're going to make contact with low energy physics as well. Is that that's sort of that's the idea. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't want to get into a big long debate about that. Um, so where am I up to? Yeah, so <coughs> right. So finite dimensional versions make sense. So let me say, what do I mean by finite? Yeah, so this is uh, uh, finite dimensional and matrices. And so, so yeah, what's the usual landscape for making things finite dimensional? So if you have a finite commutative geometry, finite commutative geometry, it's a rather poor thing to do. But, but you can, and the algebra is just lots of copies of, of C. And, and what is this? Well, each C belongs to a point. So, so this is a lattice theory. And the lattice of functions, this is the, this is the algebra of functions on, on a lattice, and these are the points, basically, of your lattice. Um, <coughs> And these are the function values at each point. And then the, you know, the Hilbert space is just, um, is just some set of fields at uh, tensor the algebra. So some CK at each point. So you all the field values at each point. Um, so the point is our finite non-commutative geometry. We can do better than this because the algebra can now have matrix algebras in it. So we can have MNC and possibly plus some more copies of MNC. By MNC, I mean the n by n matrices. Matrices with complex entries. And so, you, so already with one factor, you can have more than one factor if you want. Already with one factor, you can do this lattice thing because you think of these elements of this algebra as diagonal matrices. You see. And then here, the new game is you're allowed off-diagonal elements. So, so elements of this. So if you want to think of it that way, you have a load of points, but you also have hops between the points. And then you have, and then of course you can change basis. So the points aren't really. There's no distinguished set of points because you can change basis and think of it a different way. Um, yeah, so that's the benefits. And this sort of non commutative version of lattice theory, if you like, is much more powerful than, than just doing a lattice theory. So trying to do quantum gravity on a lattice is a bit like the old spin foam stuff, is, is you triangulate space time so you have a finite set of points, so it's sort of lattice y, and then you construct your operators like this. And so now we're doing a um, sort of non commutative version. Yeah, so uh, what else do I want to say? Yeah, that's the benefits. Uh, but I want to say some caveats that being realistic isn't possible yet. So we don't, we don't have realistic space-times yet. Uh, 
no realistic space times yet. I mean, quantum ones. So I, I, I want to deflate everybody's expectations. So you, you can't ask me, you know, what happened in the early universe or something because I can't do that yet. Um, yeah, and yeah, in particular, yeah. sorry. Well, in that, in this non-commutative version, yeah. you have the matrices. <coughs> How would you interpret something like a scale emerging? How would you see that? Is that some sort of off-diagonal element to these things? Yeah, yeah, so, right, so, okay, so that's a good question. So you, you can think of matrices, yeah, so, so what happens in a lot of these examples is you can think of your matrix, you know, you've got very large matrices, perhaps, you know, our matrices are, you know, huge matrices. And the, uh, the matrices that are, um, that have entries on the diagonal and near the diagonal, so like this, but a zero everywhere else, what you find is that these matrices, uh, they nearly commute. And just because, you know, when you calculate commutators, there aren't many terms, basically, in the commutator. And then you find the commutator is much smaller than the matrices you started with. And, and so what happens is that these matrices, which where you only have entries on the, near, near the diagonal, and then lots of zeros elsewhere, these are the low energy modes. And then these look like ordinary functions, so, or, so very approximately commutative functions. Commutative functions on some space. On a space, on a space time. Is, is this a definition? Huh? Is this a definition that they are the low energy modes, or are you? This is what happens in examples. You can do some examples, and then you just you just see this happening in the examples. But where does the scale enter? I should be able to see that I can take the limit. Yeah, right. So, so maybe we're talking about the limit where you make matrices larger and larger. Yes. Yeah. Um. Yeah, in fact, that's usually how it works. The matrices get larger. Uh, yes, where am I? Yes. So currently we're working, uh, we're looking at non commutative versions of spaces that are Euclidean. and compact. So we're looking at things like you know, the sphere and the torus and maybe CP2 and things like that, which uh, are interesting manifolds to try and make non commutative versions of and approximate and then see the Planck scale phenomena and then understand how to take a limit and recover them. But we're not doing actual physics. You know, so most of our stuff is actually two-dimensional. So, so I really want to deflate expectations here about, about what we can currently do. Um, so what do we look at? Um, we look at particular examples. Uh, examples. And they usually have high symmetry so that we can... So the examples have nice properties. So if you have some symmetry group acting, you can then use that to reduce it to some problems. It can be done on pencil and paper or mathematically, possibly. Um, we're interested in uh, sequences of these things, which then converge to a manifold. So yeah, so, so in fact, as you asked, this is the precise version of your question. So, so we take sequences as, so the matrix size goes to infinity. Um, so to understand, you know, how you can approximate uh, commutative things by non-commutative things. Um, and the other thing we're looking at is random. Uh, random non commutative geometry. Fuzzy geometries.
and these are all finite here yeah, so finite so we're doing uh, computer uh, simulations of, of ensembles of random geometries and then we're busy working out how to understand how to measure you know averages of things what, what are good things to 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 measure how do these random ensembles behave um, do they look like uh, manifolds is there sort of vacuum state which is some sort of quantum space time uh, and so on so, so is there a relation relating n to the plank is there is there an actual relation that can relate n to the plank and the energy scale of your yeah uh, yeah in principle yeah yes yeah well the details depend exactly on the the setup but yes typically uh there be some scaling parameter that scales with the matrix size and sets the, the blank scale. That's right. But it all might depend on the details of which, exactly which model you're looking at. Um, so we don't have a full understanding. So we've got some examples. There's lots more examples we haven't done yet. Um, we understand something about the sequences, but not everything. Um, we uh, have started looking at random non commuted geometries. There's lots of things we don't understand about them. There's lots of nice juicy structure in, in, in what happens in the random geometries. And what we've learnt so far from the random stuff is that most configurations, most uh, non commuted geometries, are not uh, like a manifold. So quantum fluctuations in general fluctuate over terribly non manifoldy like stuff. But, 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 um, but what we found is that uh, if we engineer a phase transition, then the vacuum is kind of manifold-like. At a phase transition. Vacuum. Mean by the well, yeah, it's manifold-like, and I put that in inverted commas because we're we're busy investigating how how good is man how manifold-like are they? Yeah, how good is that really? And yeah, well that's that's under put it under way. Uh, phase transition. Yeah, okay. I hope to come to that. Um, yeah. So anything else I meant to say didn't. Yeah, that's all my notes I need. So what else can I say? Yeah. Uh, some some particular examples I could um oh yeah, I just have yeah, it's another page of notes. Yeah, particular examples I could uh write down. So the, the standard one that everybody like loves is the fuzzy sphere, fuzzy two sphere. And here the Hilbert space is is C two uh, tensor the n by n matrices. So the algebra is the n by n matrices. And the Dirac operator. Is you write down a couple of some gamma matrices, and then you have some commutators, so like this. So the, the gamma matrices act on the C2 and the commutators act on the, this part here. So that's an operator and you have the all important plus one. Um, and what are the, the gamma matrices? They, they in fact they're just the Pauli matrices. So in this case, um, and what are the L's? The L's are the generators of the SC2 Lie algebra in the n dimensional representations. Okay. 
Okay, so you think of them as n, n by n matrices and then they act by commutators. And what you find is the eigenvalues, when you do this calculation, they, they're something like the following. So they start at some, uh, like this. So they're all the integers with zero missing and uh, there's a typical one is k up to n and then the multiplicity is uh, is what it should be is, uh, is 2, 2 mod k I think so in fact what you see is that the these eigenvalues are exactly the same as the eigenvalues of the Dirac operator on an ordinary sphere except that on an ordinary sphere they go off law to infinity and minus infinity and the multiplicity is the same as, as you normally have on, a, on an ordinary sphere but it has this cutoff. It has a cutoff at n or n minus one, which is the Planck scale. So, so it really is. This is telling you where the Planck scale is in energy terms. It's the cutoff. And this example is so super nice because, in fact, the eigenvalues are exactly the same as the classical one. So when you converge, you know, there's almost nothing to converge. It converges pointwise on the nose. Um, and you can see this. So, two dimensions. yeah, two dimensions, two spheres, and you can see that that these that that these um, these L's here, in fact, are nearly diagonal <coughs> matrices, so they almost commute, and they provide you know the three coordinates on the sphere, and the sum of the squares is the Casimir operation itself. So it's all. Yeah. What, what do you mean by the Planck scale? Well, it's the energy scale. I mean the Dirac operator. The eigenvalues have have uh, have uh, your, your energies. So they. I thought you didn't see that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, just, you know, maximum energy, that's what I mean. Okay, so there's a fuzzy torus which uh, James Gaunt has worked on a lot with me. James Gaunt. Um, <clears throat> and just to show you it's a bit non trivial, I'll write down the formula. There is. So now it's a similar setup except the Hilbert space is C4 tensor n by n matrices. And you take two matrices which uh, Q commute. So we have U and V equals, what did you call it? With Q. So Q is a complex number. To me, n is one. That root of unity. And here's the formula: the Dirac <coughs> operator. So this is completely new. The paper that isn't on the archive is. Long to write up. Plus similar terms where you exchange. No, no, yeah, no, I better write out the more terms. Plus one over four. Q to a quarter. Plus Q to minus quarter. So it's just to show you that this is a bit non trivial here. And these are anti commutators. And then there's some similar terms of anti commutators which I'm not going to write out. But if we follow that pattern. And this is the, the gamma file operator here. And then what you learn, so in fact, so intriguingly, 
this is a quantization of the following formula. That you write, you can write the Dirac operator on a torus as the following way. Ah, sorry, it's the wrong formula. Here it is. Yeah. On the normal torus, you can write it as the following way. And then a similar formula with Feature and fire. Interchanged. So when you stare at this formula, you realise that what's happening is that these derivatives that you normally write become something like the commutators, and the the other terms, in fact this is the spin connection term, they become the anti-commutators. And again, you can work out the spectrum of this, and what you find is it's not exactly the spectrum of this operator, but it's a, it's a deformation of the spectrum of this operator. And interestingly, this this spectrum here, this uh, the so the, the standard classical spectrum has um, eigenvalues plus or minus the square root of uh, n squared plus m squared, where n and m lie on a torus. Oh, sorry, n and m are integers, and this one here, the eigenvalues, very entertainingly, are plus or minus the square root of the Q numbers at N and M. Where the Q number then is something like sine pi. Ah, and I've confused the two ends here. Damn it. The, this shouldn't be N, let's call it K. Sine pi K over N over sine over n. So looking uh, to all the world like some quantum group uh, analogue of the of the ordinary torus. So there's even hints here of how the the uh, non-commutative geometry things all the different bits of pieces of this formula correspond to the, well, the classical bits of the formula. And I can show you um, on my slide how that torus looks. Uh, let's see, I was here, wasn't it? Spectrum looks like it, it shows you very well you know, what's going on here. Uh, that button, yes, there we are. So this uh, this picture here, uh, made by James, is here. So um, so this is the dispersion relation for the usual torus. So in fact, there's can't really see, but there's an integer grid here. The points here from 0, 100, 200 on here. And so this is uh, what I called M and K here um, along these axes here. So in fact. The, the points here are, are uh, the integer points, well actually there's a lot of them, they're a very fine sc mesh scale here. And this is the usual, these are the eigenvalues here, this uh, root k squared plus m squared, this formula here is the blue. And then the, the, it's been cut away so I can put both on the same thing. And this is the, the quantum formula, the, the non-commutative formula here. And the important point is here, you see this is the low energy scale, you see this is the Planck scale here. So in fact, the, the energies go up and then they come back down again. Uh, but this is the low energy scale here. So if this is 10 to the 
19 GV, we are, we're right down here. And then you can see that you know, the, these two cones exactly match here. And it's only when you get up near the Planck scale that the, the dispersion relations come apart. And you see the non commutativity makes a huge difference here. So this, these just go off to infinity, whereas these, these cover in. Okay. And then I want to talk about the random space. So while I'm here, this um, so this is a, this is an example of a uh, this is a very simple toy example of a Dirac operator. It's a bit like the examples I've had here, except they just have two anti-commutators. And now what you do here is H1 and H2 are random matrices. They're random Hermitian matrices. So no, we're no longer doing a, a single geometry. We're doing random geometries. Um, so we write down an action for this Dirac operator, and then we do a Monte Carlo uh, simulation of the ensemble of all these Dirac operators. So we're doing quantum geometry, hooray, on the computer. And, uh, <coughs> and we have a coupling constant in this, in our action. And we can dial this coupling constant to make a phase transition. And we can look at, for example, here we looked at the trace of matrix H1 on this axis, and trace of H2 on the other axis. And we see before the phase transition, they're all just cut in the middle, doing nothing much. And, uh, and this is what happens at the phase transition. You get, you get to the phase transition and suddenly, boom, the structure appears. Um, and you get, uh, typically it's these phase transitions, you get a lot of non-local correlations uh, going on at, exactly at phase transition. So this is really exciting. It's just like a second order phase transition in, say, uh, lattice QCD exactly the same thing that happens. Um, and uh, so a lot of spread of, of behaviour and non-local correlations, which Maurer at the back here made these plots, uh, and he's busy uh, investigating exactly what goes on. And these are his plots, yes, so... Um, and this is after the phase transition. Uh, so the middle all clears out, it settles down into these things having a nice circle shape uh, for this. So the, the geometry is specified by these two points here, which can be anywhere on the circle, because it's sort of symmetry. So um, I thought I'd also show you some of the work with Lisa, which uh, we did a little while ago now, which... Um, so yeah. So yeah. You don't. I mean, that, that I was just showing you. You know, what, that there is a phase transition, and that, and that, yeah, how it goes. But I'll show you some more slides now, which a bit more. Uh, geez, where? where are so what, what's the action? Yeah. So the action is quite simple. It's really using the following action. Uh, is a uh, trace of d fourth minus a coupling constant times d squared. So plus a coupling constant d squared. And the interesting thing is when this g2 is negative. Because then this potential is like a Higgs potential. And then you have. Yes. Well, okay, so uh, first this is the simplest thing we thought of that did something non-trivial, had a phase transition. But secondly, this appears when you do an expansion of the action that gives you the gravity in the standard model in the usual uh, Alan Korn Shamsadeen game. This is this is the term in the expansion. So so yeah, so Euclidean. It's Euclidean, everything's Euclidean, as I said, yeah, so, so please, yeah, don't get too excited. Uh, yeah, so now I want to go to, uh, gee, where is it, talks, so we get the, yeah, so this is uh, what I did with Lisa a while ago. So we're doing, we're calculating the partition function, we integrate over the Dirac operators in a suitable class. Uh, e to the minus an action, the action is on the board, as long as it's uh, bounded below. Then the, and it goes to infinity as the Dirac goes to infinity, that's a key thing, which this does. This Dirac is large, this action is large, and the whole thing exists, you see, the integral exists, so, so everything is perfectly fine. And you can simulate it on a computer. That's what we do. So, uh, yeah. And, th and 
Another beautiful thing is this has huge symmetries. In fact, any unitary that preserves all the structures in the Hilbert space, uh, the action is invariant under it because it's a trace of stuff. And these turn out to be the gauge and diffeomorphism symmetries of, of, of our physics. Um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so the, action, so the potential looks like this. Um, and, uh, and this is what we find for our phase transition. So what we're looking at here, you can't quite see, but it's the eigenvalue histogram. So on the bottom here is the numerical value of the eigenvalues. And then plotted up here is some measure of the density. Um, and then this coupling constant here, G2, that got curves for various different values. So when G2 is zero, you see the blue thing, which is just a heap of eigenvalues uh, sort of splodged in the middle there. And when, as you increase, make G2 more negative, the middle of the eigenvalue distribution hollows out because we're starting to get the double well picture. And then at some critical value, boom, it disappears, you see. The middle of the distribution disappears. And then for the purple, it's really gone. There's a complete gap here. And the interesting thing here is what happens at the phase transition. And that's exactly when the eigenvalue distribution is doing this here. And that's manifold-like behaviour. It's exactly what the eigenvalue distribution looks like on a manifold. Um, and you see, so just to explain here, if you look at the density of states or eigenvalue distribution on the manifold, it goes like mod lambda to the d minus 1. So this is, uh, on the one manifold, you'd see a constant density of states. On a two manifold, you'd see a v. On a three manifold, a parabola, and so on. So you can go back now to this and say, well, what is this? You know, what, you know, and this data isn't very fine, but you could say, well, okay, what curve is this? Is this a parabola? Is this actually a v or what? Um, and, well, by eye, you, can, you can't really tell, actually. But we, so we've now done quite a lot of work to make better measures of what this dimension is. Um, we've got a new paper coming out soon with, with all sorts of dimension measures and running the data on them to see what the dimension is. And uh, the answer is most of our smaller models are dimension two, or roughly dimension two. And some of them, actually some of them don't have a good, some of them don't have a good phase transition. So, so there's quite a lot of different things going on. Um, so how do we know there is a phase transition? Well, here's, here's some stats for some of the Monte Carlo. Uh, you calculate, so this is the, geez, help. yeah, so this is the, uh, the coupling constant from zero down to minus five. And this is the value here at which crazy things happen. We've got the mean of the uh, action. Yes, Lisa, help me. The blue line is the action, just the action. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is the variance of the action, goes haywire. And this is the autocorrelation time, so the between successive Monte Carlo points. And these are absolutely characteristic of a, of a second order phase transition. So, so we're pretty confident that's what's going on. Uh, what else can we say? Oh yeah, the, this is a spectral variance. It's a it's a adaptation of the spectral dimension measure, which Thomas has written about. Um, and we can see here before the phase transition, it's looking one dimensional. After the phase transition, higher dimensional. Although the dimension varies a lot, it's difficult to say. And this this one here is very close to the phase transition, and this this particular model here is looking fairly two dimensional. So. Uh, I could say more about that, but it would just be technical detail. That's the sort of thing we're doing. Um, and we can, for example, we can now look at the fuzzy sphere, which is the, which is the black line, and we compare it to our, to our random geometry here, which is this line, and this is the spectral variance, which is like the spectral dimension. So it's a dimension measure that depends on an energy scale t. So this is very high energy here, and this this. Uh, See, for, a, for an ordinary manifold, it goes to the classical value there. It would be two, say. These lines would go straight there. But when you have a cutoff at the very high energy, it falls down to zero. So this is the Planck scale behavior. This here is the, is the low energy behavior, and it's telling you you have a, a compact space. So, so as long as it, if your energy scale is even bigger than the size of the whole space, you get sort of nonsense here, or it falls to zero. So this is the interesting region here. We can even learn something. You see, in our random geometries, they're a bit less uh, regular than the, than the fuzzy 
uh, sphere. In the fuzzy sphere, you have degeneracies. The argument is they're integers and you have degeneracies. But in the random thing, they're not integers and they spread out a bit from those degenerate. You don't have degeneracies, they spread out. And that's why this distribution is kind of softened here. We sort of understand this more. Understand. Yeah. Can you give us the actual statistical yeah. yeah. model? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're actually using the geometry. Right? Yeah. That's the idea. So, yeah. okay. so then, so then, what, what's this operator acts on elements in the Hilton space? I guess, right? so this isn't. So I shouldn't think of this as like the path integral describing. This is like the path integral. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're integrating over all Dirac's, which you can think of as integrating over the data that goes into the Dirac, which is like integrating over the frame field in the, you know, in, in the, in the normal, uh, or integrating over the metric in the normal presentation. Yeah, so you only think it's the matrix that gets around it. Yeah. So if I, if I want to think about some low energy fields, yeah. which is whatever. Right, but, uh, how do I, do I feed that into this? Well, what we haven't done is coupled this to matter fields, to right. other fields. And you can do that because, as I said earlier, the standard model has a description in terms of this same stuff. So all you have to do is tensor the Hilbert space with the Hilbert space of the standard model. And then you have ready-made matter fields. You have Higgs field, you have gauge fields, uh, and you have the fermion fields all sitting there on your space-time. And we could do this. We haven't done it. Our computer is groaning already at doing what we're doing. If we added more, it'd probably be better go even slower. So, you know, for practical reasons, we haven't done it. But yeah, we can we can do it in principle. Uh, and we're busy writing a much faster code. So, so maybe when that's up and going, then we'll be able to add in a gauge field that we could maybe do. We could do maybe do a QCD coupled to a random space time. That would be fun. Uh, yeah, there's no reason why we can't do it. It's absolutely set up to do that. Actually, probably the next thing to do is to integrate over the fermions as well. So, so this is entirely a bosonic integral. All the, the fields in the Dirac operator, the, the, the metric, the gauge fields, the Higgs perhaps, all the bosonic fields. The thing it acts on is the fermion fields. So there should be a determinant here as well for the fermion determinant. But we haven't put that in the model yet. That's, that's work to do. Uh, and it might change things. So, you guys at the back. Another game to play. So that's more or less it. That's that's my time up. So when you when you uh, change to Lorentzian signature, yeah, do you expect to have to impose some causality conditions by hand to make this work? We understand very little about Lorentzian. I mean, you can sort of guess what the formulas might be. We haven't really done anything seriously to to. Uh, yeah, there are a few papers about the Lorentzian framework. You know, I know what a Dirac operator is. I've never tried to do random Dirac operators. And, uh, and I've never, in fact, I've only ever tried to write down the Dirac on flat Minkowski space. I don't even really have, you know, good formulas for it on, on other spaces, so. I guess I wonder whether you'll encounter pro similar problems to CDT where, you know, when you go from Euclidean right relations to, to the yeah. other ones, you actually need to, by hand, sort of impose extra conditions to select the ones that are causal. Yes, it could be, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm right. Yes, so, so the, I, yeah, I've got some ideas, but, but yeah, we haven't really tried, tried hard, so, yeah, there, there could be all sorts of problems. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that it'll just look like an analytic continuation and it'll be just like Hawking always said it was, you do you could do half integral and you only continue to get in case that would be lovely but, but very optimistic. Very optimistic, <laughs> yeah, but I don't really know. So John, can I just check out the yeah. exactly what you've done? So so basically you, you take some random geometry yeah. and you carry it over to eigenvalues yeah. and yeah. then you, you take the straight basis of some of the other eigenvalues and shove it there and that's that's what you do. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, correct. I have a question about ideas in four dimensions. Yes. At least Well, th yeah, so that's a good question. So, um, well, we can make a four dimensional example. We can take two two spheres and, and tense them together, and then we have S2 plus S2. So, yeah, we, we can do that. Um, and you could, 
uh, yeah, so so we, you know, we can do four dimensional examples. You're, so the question is, would it turn out to still be a symplectic manifold? I think that's the question. And we don't quite understand that. At the moment, all, the, all our examples constructed with high symmetry and using sort of techniques of like geometric quantization all turn out to be symplectic manifolds. Um, we don't yet know if that's true in general. And yeah, so S4 is not, S4 is not yeah. So, um, I mean, there are works where people look at non commutative manifolds more, in more general, and then they're not, you know, um, uh, they're, you know they're not symplectic manifolds. So it may be that, that, that the, well, it depends what you mean, Zach. So, so you limit to a manifold, and then, you know, and then there's the next correction for the non commutativity, and that might be some sort of plus on structure. That's perfectly fine. Um, but the actual limiting thing, um, you know, doesn't have to be a symplectic manifold. Um, so whether whether the sorts of manifolds we can we can approximate are too limited that way, I don't know yet. Um, and that's part of the reason why we're trying to do lots of examples and um, you know and sort of investigate the possible space. Um, but, you know, we've focused a lot on doing symmetry, examples of the symmetry, but what I really want to do is do one without the symmetry and see, see, see where you can push that. But that is quite hard to do because you can only do it numerically and it's actually quite hard to even see what the hell's going on. I mean, you know, computer full of matrices and you think, well, what, yeah, okay, well, what is that? <laughs> and it's not, that's not quite an easy question to answer. My other question is yeah. two-dimensional examples. In the 90s, there was very active research uh, two-dimensional random geometric symmetry. Is there any relation? Yes. Well, of course, the, the very, very simplest example um, is the Dirac is just a commutator or anti-commutator with one matrix, and then you're looking at a random matrix model, and then exactly you can look up, and we've done this. There are analytic results. You can just say, okay, well, that, that's it, and that, and we've checked that our computer simulations fit those as well. But as soon as you get to um, to more complicated models with more gamma matrices, basically, it's the number of gamma matrices, then the number of random matrices in, in the Dirac operator gets very large. And then, you know, you can't obviously map it to, to a random matrix problem that's been studied before. So if you like, we're studying a multi-matrix, uh, random matrix model, but they have never been studied before. But, it, but, uh, but there's another thing on top of that. We're not just looking at a matrix, random matrix model because we're interpreting it as a Dirac operator. And what's important for us is the geometry of that Dirac operator, not the geometry of the little ma matrices that make it up. They're sort of irrelevant. Um, so yeah, it is matrix models, but with a particular interpretation. So just this question about the very <coughs> Looks at sort of ultra high energy scattering of the uh, particles in supermassive. Mm. You have this sort of massive like, you, know, is, you can calculate. Uh, I think this, a lot of this is the inspiration for some of this classification the ideas that it's done about a piece of it. But how does that fit? Never mind classification, but, but how does this, that thing in the calculation? No idea. I'm not familiar with, with his, his stuff. But. Definitely, we, you know, we don't want anything that's super planky, that's for sure. 